Uh, thank you all so much for being here today. I'm Farrell Hoy Janab, the Director of Faculty Development. And I'm up here sort of speaking on behalf of the um, Center for Teaching and Learning Faculty Fellows, who uh, were looking for a way to, to honor our uh, retiring faculty and came up with this idea of um, the last lecture, which is a, is a, the last lecture dates back to actually medieval times, as many of our educational practices seem to do. But um, in modern times, it's a tradition where um, it, pr professors are invited to sort of reflect on their um, personal philosophies, their life lessons, things they want to leave behind to their students, to their colleagues, to the institution that they have served. So it um, kind of started in the, I started doing it in the Ivy Leagues in the early 30s. Then in 2008 or so, there was a book called The Last Lecture. And so a lot of people are familiar with that, but this is actually a tradition that, ex that has been around for a long time. Um, this year, our retiring, we do have our retiring faculty on the back of your program here, Jeff Blodig in Human Sciences, Alicia Bredehoft in Human Sciences, Judy Guzzi, Librarian, Kay King in Criminal Justice, and Edward Ronenbaum, Nursing. So we sent out a, an invitation to these retiring faculty members to see if they would want to, if they could um, join us and share some of their, their last thoughts. So and when Alicia and Kay um, agreed to do it. So I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, Alicia Bredehoff is going to, we're going in alphabetical order, so Alicia will go first. She works in the counseling office, and I'll let you take it from there, Alicia. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you very much to both Megan and, and Farrell for this opportunity to be here today. Um, when I got the email, I was sharing with a few of you that I, I, I read it as, oh, can you do kind of a little, you know, kind of last kind of thoughts, and I thought this would be like a, a video in the TV center that they'd stick on a web page, and <laughs> then, 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 <laughs> then Megan said, oh, I reserved the Hudson. I'm like, for what? <laughs> for what? So here we are today. So um, actually, I'm going to pull up my PowerPoint real here, real quick, and let's see. Whoops, wrong one. Oh, it's okay. There you go. Thank you so very much. All right. So we'll get our slideshow here. And actually, this is kind of how I was going to start, is that you're going to have to give me a little bit of grace because my classroom is my office. So it's usually one-on-one -on -one with students. So I am not normally in front of a large group of people here. So um, thank you very much. There you go. Okay, good. Marvelous. Well, I wanted to start with, and my little yellow folder went with Farrell. Farrell, can I have my notes? <laughs> Underneath, there you go. Sorry. That's okay. No problem at all. Okay. Um, well, I wanted to kind of start um, by again um, saying this last lecture I think is an incredible idea. And I did Google it, and I found out that the first thing that came up was um, the gentleman that was writing the book because he was dying. So I thought maybe Megan knew something I didn't know. <laughs> um, but that's not the case. So. Thank you for sharing that history. That was very, very helpful. Um, so since I started at Johnson County Community College 31 years ago, um, before I started here, um, I wasn't married. So since I've been here, I've gotten married. I have two awesome kids. Um, I've lost both of my parents since I've been here. And um, neither of my parents went to college. And so they were my biggest champions on doing my undergraduate work and uh, encouraging me to pursue my master's. My dad worked in the savings and loan industry. Does anybody remember savings and loans? And my mom stayed home with us kids. And anytime we brought a form home from school and she had to write her occupation, she wrote domestic engineer. Um, so um, I have a lot of encouragement um, to, again, pursue my education. So I feel very grateful to be here today. Um, and then um, as when I got married since I've been here, like I said, and my husband and I just celebrated our 30th wedding anniversary last year. And this June, I will be 60 years old. So a whole lifetime is what I'm calling this today. So <clears throat> all right. Yay. <laughs> um, most importantly, again, thank you all for taking the time to come. This was not mandatory. So um, I, you know, I'm glad that you are here, and we very much appreciate that. Um, here at Johnson County, um, with this 31 years of student services, I've been engaged actively in working with students for those 31 years all within the student services branch, which means if you think about the enrollment phase of summer, fall, and spring, this is my 93rd enrollment here at Johnson County. Kind of by the numbers, too, um, I also taught one course here for a while, business office technology one year when I, 
I started here as the records manager back in the day, which is the registrar. And uh, I was asked to teach that class, so uh, that's my one. And then um, I've had the opportunity to serve under six different presidents in 31 years. And I've also um, um, have uh, um, also worked with, um, I mean, survived, I mean, um, I mean, worked with um, eight different vice presidents within our branch, student services. So anyway, that's just a little bit more about the details by the numbers. And obviously, you can tell I'm not good with numbers, which I'll mention here in a little bit. So OK, um, so as I mentioned earlier, um, um, I'm, uh, oops, going a little fast. I'm not used to being always in front of a large group, although I, I, I enjoy talking. So I, I, <laughs> I thank you for being here. <laughs> Um, and unlike, again, that classroom, I'm usually in a one-on-one -on -one situation with students for the most part. And so um, I did title my presentation Heart of Success because that's where I function from, is from the heart. And so the passion that we all have in this room for education, for impacting others, I think comes truly from the heart. So this is um, what I want to kind of start with a little bit is a little bit of history. Yes, I'm the lovely person in the front with the permed hair, the shoulder pads, and the pantyhose. Um, when I first started here at Johnson County Community College, there was no such thing as email. Does anybody remember the first email that came through, the name of it? Pine. 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 So that, there was no email when we started, when I started. And so um, the other thing, too, is um, student services office, offices were all open till 7 p.m. So we used to kind of, yeah, I see Eleanor and one of my colleagues like, wow, 7 p.m. So, and even before me, they used to be open until 9 p.m., counseling, career, everybody. And so that they used to, when I came on board and it was 7, they're like, oh, this is so great. They said, you know, people that just kind of drive the 435 loop, they see the lights on, and they come by Johnson County Community College. So I was really glad that it was 7. So, um, And then also when I first started here, there's a different database. So I'm looking at Sandra. It was called CAST. It was a homegrown um, product, and so I was part as records manager of that conversion of the old academic history into what we know as Banner and Aleutian today. So I take no responsibility for Banner whatsoever. <laughs> um, and so, pardon me. Um, the other thing, this is my records team. I should have introduced them. These are the people that took a chance on me and hired me because I really came back from, came through higher ed, starting in a residential life background type of thing, and so. Um, some of you faculty that have been here a while may remember that, that, that you used to fill out a paper roster with your grades, and then the wonderful administrative assistants, which were at the time called secretaries, would bring them down to the records office, and then it would take this team here, my wonderful team with a couple admissions people's, people three days, about 16 people three days, eight hours a day to enter grades for each individual student for each individual roster. So things have come a long way, long, long way. Um, I'm still um, friends with the majority of these um, lovely women here. About two months after I started, they all showed up at my wedding in Columbia, Missouri, circa 1993. So um, definitely very, very fortunate to have had a group of people that believed in me that so much. Uh, believed in me so much when I started, because I really didn't have a background. I'm kind of sure not how I got the job, but here I am. So, okay. Um, let's see. I want to tell you a little bit about presentation today, and I'll kind of pick it up a little bit. So I want to talk a little bit about student development theory um, and how we look at student success um, through that, kind of starting with basically kind of going over Chickering and Fair, Chickering's development vectors and share a little bit, um, a few student stories within that, and then just kind of share some guiding principles that I've used in my career here at the college. So Chickering pretty much is a great framework for understanding how students function at this age. And of course, granted, our students can be anywhere. I mean, I think our average age used to be 26. Although every fall, we get one out of every four Johnson County High School seniors. So in August, <laughs> those 3,000 students that decide to enroll in August, they're all coming from the local high schools. Um, so we can kind of, I'm sure in any office that you work in on campus, you're going to recognize a lot of these kind of functionalities or these, mo these motions that are, or these phases that students are going through or experiencing at this age group. Developing competence is a huge one. Um, and so this is where students, again, are learning who they are, what they can do, what they're interested in, where they're headed. Um, a lot of emotional regulation, emotional intelligence, kind of navigating that. And again, I know you see that in your classroom on a variety of, on the, on the whole variety spectrum of student behavior. 
Developing autonomy is very, very significant um, with students that we all work with. Um, probably my most impactful student story was I had just kind of entered the counseling center um, in, in 96, and I had a student that came in, um, it was near the end of August, but back in those days, you could register two weeks into the semester. And this young lady was from an area high school, very bright young lady, had gone to, I think, SMU, and her first few weeks down there, she found out she was pregnant. So she came home, still wanted to go to school, came into the counseling office, and I got to work with her. And so we helped her get started, still got a full schedule, and off she went, and she finished her associate's degree. She moved in with her parents. She had her little son, her boy, kept kind of track with her, worked with her. She got her, her, uh, associ her, her associates, and then she went on and got her bachelor's degree. So years go by, and about four years ago, I get a phone call. And she's like, hey, Alicia, this is Jenny. Do you remember me? I'm like, Jenny, I absolutely do. How are you? She said, fine. She said, however, my son just finished his freshman year at another Kansas four-year school and didn't do so well and isn't happy. Would you work with my son? And that, <laughs> that's when I kind of realized I had arrived. Um, <laughs> and so I said, sure. He can. And I said, well, what have you been up to? You know, how did everything go? And she said, oh, I'm doing great. She said, you know, um, my, I married my son's father when he was about five years old. And she said, now we have six kids. <laughs> and um, she's actually working in education as well. So this whole experience of taking ownership of, of, your, of your life, taking ownership of your responsibilities and who you are, um, this slide kind of really reminded me of, of that student. So I wanted to share that with you all today. Um, establishing identity, again, I'm sure you're already thinking of quite a few students that um, you've engaged with over the years as well. Um, developing mature and interpersonal relationships, um, again, what we're here to do is help students, again, find their footing, find where they are, and um, help them, you know, navigate what that looks like for them in their world. Um, developing purpose. This is probably my favorite slide within the chickering vectors of student development, because this is what we do in the Counseling Center. And um, each day we help students explore their personal goals. We work with them helping their, develop, you know, developing their education goals and their education plans, and then where they're headed from there. And we also, of course, have that whole, the, earlier, the emotional, social piece of it. And the gift here, um, and I'm going to shameless plug, um, counseling faculty, we meet those students where they're at. Many of you in here, I know I've worked with several of your children, and they go off to a four-year school, and they're going to get maybe 15 minutes with an advisor, of which they may have probably already figured out what they needed to take and where they're headed. And the gift that we have here at uh, Johnson County Community College is that quality, full 50-minute to an hour session with students where can, we can really understand who they are, what they want, how we can help them with the resources that we have on campus, and, and, and achieve those goals so that they can move forward with their lives. Um, so this developing purpose is very much what I very strongly identify with, within all of the different vectors that are there. Um, developing integrity, um, obviously that is something that we hope our society will start maybe moving back to in some ways. Um, and so we have a true impact Again, whether you're that frontline person that the student comes in and talks to um, and, or not, um, or, or ha is having a rough day and, and you're helping them navigate that or figure out what, they don't always know what their first question is, let alone their second and third. So helping students know how to engage with the world around them. Um, one of the other the philosophies too is Terry O'Banion, and he talks a lot about helping students figure out what they want, where they want, and providing a clear path through. And again, the passion for the branch that I have, have had the opportunity to work in, we all focus on this from the first contact with a student as a prospective student um, and helping them create that opportunity for themselves to move forward again, find out where they're headed. Um, so Terry O'Banion has been a big influence on me as well, um, especially in the community college setting. Okay, I think the next part um, I want to get into quickly is just six things that I value. So kind of as a last lecture opportunity, I saw it as a chance to share with you some things that I found helpful in my career and things that I think that are important in being successful. One of those is building cross-campus relationships. Um, if you, uh, well, there's a picture here I'm going to show you in a minute, but um, it, it is just probably the greatest gift that you can have. There are so many great people here, people that have similar values and interests. If you're trying to get something to move forward, you want to have that partnership, but you also want to get that input from other people when you're looking at those new ideas so that you also get the support and also look at maybe whatever the, the idea is that you can um, you know, get, that, get that traction that you need to move forward. 
Um, also, with building cross-campus relationships, it's really nice when you're in the cafeteria and you meet somebody you know and there's someone to talk to or someone to sit with. So um, there's just a lot of people in this room that I've had the gift of, of working with over the years um, within, within um, of course, those relationships in, in your own division are very important, but this is kind of looking at the bigger, bigger side of that. So um, I really feel that that's probably been my greatest um, adventure and opportunity here is to build those, those relationships. And kind of a, this is kind of a flip side of that, but this picture here, <laughs> this is, the t-shirts say it's been a banner year at JCCC. So again, I think we just finished the conversion, our first enrollment. Um, over here on the far left, does anybody recognize who that is? Sherry Haynes, okay. Um, still to this day, she, she's now the registrar, I call her. Like, hey, I need help. Um, Del Lovett. So I had the gift of working with her. She started in admissions, and now she's in charge of like the world. <laughs> um, Margie Shelley, you know, before she left here, she was in, the, uh, the, in a dean role, and, and, and Margie and I started about six months apart. She was the admissions manager, and I was the records manager. So those relationships, I think, are so very important to not only your success, but your, you know, your personal health, your mental health, and that support that you get here at the college. Um, getting engaged with the JCC community. <clears throat> uh, when I say campus kickoff, we're getting ready to have campus craze days, and just walk around the campus. So one of my simple challenges to each of you is to do that. I didn't do it enough. I get stuck in the student center. I was just talking to Christine and. Uh, Christina, uh, <coughs> the other day, and I, uh, just a minute ago, and I wish I would have walked the campus more. So I'm not just talking about getting your steps in, which is a good thing too, but get out there and make sure you just, just enjoy the campus. I mean, how many people do you talk to that come to our campus and say, wow, this place is huge. This place is beautiful. And <coughs> that's, I don't have any regrets in my life, but that's one thing in the next 60 days I plan on doing a lot more of. And so, now the next one, Farrell did not pay me to put that in there. Professional de development days, professional learning days. I can speak personally from my role here as counseling. We're really busy in August. We don't get the opportunity to take advantage of that like we would love to do, but we're doing other important work. And so I just, again, another challenge for you all. I encourage you to present during those opportunities. There's so many amazing people in this room. It can be academic related. It can be related to really to anything. But get out there and share your perspective and share your knowledge and encourage people to do that. And so I'm not sure as retirees if we can do professional learning days, but I might crash a few this year. Um, get involved in, in, a, in, a, in something beyond your division, the staff council, academic branch, hiring committees. If there's one thing you take away, to me that is the most important thing that we do here at this institution. And when you serve on a hiring committee, you're choosing your colleagues. So whether it's in your own department or it's across campus. My other thing I would ask of you, is with if and when, and hopefully you do get to serve on hiring committees, that you become a champion for that person that you hire. I fully believe that anybody on a hiring committee is responsible for that success of the person that gets hired. So um, if you take anything away, please take that today. And then, well, if you want to do strategic planning, at least do it once. <laughs> taking risks, taking risks. Okay, so I took a risk applying for that job. There was like supposedly 50 people in the pool for records manager. I had no registrar experience. It is still a mystery to me how I got that job. But I took the risk because this is where I wanted to be. I wanted to work at Johnson County Community College. Another risk I took more recently was I got this phone call from this guy named Jim Leaker. Liker. Sorry, Jim. He's not here. Jim. Jim called me and he said, uh, would you like to serve on the faculty association negotiation team? And I about fell off my chair. Um, and so I, I did think about it and I went back to him and I said, yes, I would be honored to do that. And so that was a risk. I learned a lot. I met a lot of amazing people, learned a lot about interest-based bargaining and um, having served here both in administrative roles and faculty roles, it was a great experience to bring those two together to look at the goals of the institution and, and to try and create some positive solutions. And then of course my last risk was saying yes to this. So. Um, but I do think taking risks is very, very important. Um, continue learning and growth. Um, my story on that is, as I mentioned, numbers aren't my thing. I was a freshman in college and I was an accounting major. It was the most painful two years of my life. <laughs> <laughs> Dave stepped in like 30 seconds ago. I'm glad, perfect timing, Dave. I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't pay you to do that either, but 
Um, and so I was miserable. And so life's paths change, take you on different routes. You end up in different places. And then again, again, about higher education. This is the gift that we give students. Um, last time I checked, I think institutional research said 40% of our students were deciding or undecided. And I would say from the world I live in, it's at least 70% of students. And so this whole growth and continual learning, my little story is I went, to, I went to Mizzou, the University of Missouri, I know, on the Missouri side. And I remember it was the October of my sophomore year. We had to declare your major in the School of Business because you're going to be a ju junior. And I sat in that woman's office, and these big crocodile tears just came down my face. And she grabbed my hand. She said, Alicia, let me walk you down to the arts and sciences. <laughs> and I'm forever grateful for that, forever, ever grateful. That was about it on career counseling in my experience, but I was forever grateful for that. <clears throat> Gratitude. Um, this, there's so much research on it, um, but when you are appreciative and recognize the things that are happening around you, even during the difficult times, it lifts you up. Um, it's great, again, for your mental health when you look at the positive side of things. And um, in the 31 years I've been here, I decided not to list the things <laughs> that were kind of challenges for me or hard times um, because I always found a silver lining in those and found a way to move forward. Um, this is one of my favorite quotes regarding gratitude. Um, it's not happy people who are thankful, it's thankful people who are happy. Valuing people. Right there I could probably stop. Valuing people is probably, um, I should have started that with, as number one. And I think um, for all of you being here today, you're certainly helping me feel very valued, so thank you very much. Um, but, um, and I've talked a lot, um, I was just kind of curious when you saw that come up, valuing people, what did that mean to you? When you, when you value people, how do you do that? What does that look like? You show up. You might write somebody a note or an email. How else do people value people? This is why I couldn't teach, because... <laughs> listening, 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 wonderful. And each day, everyone has get to do this. We get to listen to students. We get to help a colleague going through a difficult time. Um, we get to solve a problem together. I'm looking at Susan McGarvey. She's my great problem solver over there in Railroad. Um, but you have to value valuing those people. And one of the things I wanted to share, I didn't bring a whole lot of visual aids. <clears throat> this has kind of been a this has been a driving force for me. The basic principles, Johnson County Community College, 1998. And they are, it's about valuing people. Focus on the situation, issue of behavior, not the person. Maintain the self-confidence and self-esteem of others. Maintain constructive relationships. Take initiative to make things better and lead by example. So to me, that's how we need to be valuing people. And, and I think we do it well here most of the time. Celebrate good things. I'm right down there in the front in my little 15 t-shirt. We do a lot of this in our branch, too. So <laughs> someone just said, gosh, counseling gives the best retirement parties. And we sure do. But this is our whole branch right here. Don't take yourself too seriously. Um, this is during the pandemic, so I'm sure we're at least six feet apart. Um, we're throwing snowballs in the air. This is actually like late November, and um, I'm there on the end. So definitely don't take yourself too seriously. Um, and we put fun. Putting fun in the world of work is great, and counselors are probably the best at being dysfunctional. So um, actually, thank you again all for being here today. Um, tried not to read my slides but I'm going to read this one. My wish for each of you is success and fulfillment in your personal and career journey to achieve your goals and thrive in higher education, to make a difference for the next generation, and remember a heart of gratitude can keep the momentum going. And then finish strong. And I've watched this the last five years in my career, not really knowing it's five years, but definitely the last two. And it's really easy. I, I, I'm having, I'm going to get emotional. I'm having a lot of mixed emotions about leaving. But they say, you know when it's time, and it's time. But I wanted to finish strong, and I got the incentive from my son. It's not that big of a deal. I'm just emotional. <laughs> so my son ran cross country, and I just remember standing there at the finish line or running from, that's the other thing, thing. cross country is not like a spectator sport. So the first meet I went to, like I'm wearing, you know, coming from the college and I've got my heels on, I'm like, oh, this is bad. <laughs> so anyway, I just remember chasing him to each place and at the end yelling, finish strong, finish strong. And so I decided to take my own advice. 
Um, thank you all for being here. I appreciate the time, and thank you again to um, Center of Teaching and Learning. Uh, what's your fancy name now? Center of Teaching, Teaching and Learning. <laughs> what's old is new again, right? It's an important stuff. But thank you all for being here, and to Megan, thank you very much for the opportunity. So, thank you. So now we have Dr. Kay King. Michael was my techie guy like a very long time ago, so he bailed me out again. So welcome, welcome to this, this presentation. Um, I get to talk about critical thinking one last time probably, so I'm so excited to be here. This is the book I use in my classes, and I'm going to talk about uh, pieces of this. So, so hopefully I'm going to convince you, if you're not already using critical thinking, in your classes, your existing content, to maybe consider trying, trying to do that. And I've taken some, some um, quotes from the book, so I, I'm not, I don't get paid to, to push the book, but I think it's an amazing book. I've been using it in my classes for a lot, a lot of years. Um, all my students have to have the critical thinking book in addition to the course content. So they might have a corrections book or a criminal behavior book or an or a ethics book, but they also have that in the critical thinking book. And I'm going to circle back to this, but to teach critical thinking effectively, you have to teach both components. You can't try to integrate critical thinking into the content. So you have to teach critical thinking content separate and teach your course content too. And you, 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 you marry them, you put them together. So I love this saying about, um, and you, can, you all can read that. So if you have an open mind, people are going to try and fill it up with stuff, okay? You have to decide if you want to let them put it in your mind or not. So I love this saying about the trouble with having an open mind. So I took some of the prompts from, from when, when our suggestion from this, for this presentation. So things I would like to hold dear. Don't raise your voice. Improve your argument. So what do we do in society? We raise our voice. We, we get louder and louder and louder, and the other person has to respond. But if you, if you have a quiet voice and say something that, that's meaningful, then you don't have to raise your voice. <coughs> Things to remember. I don't persuade someone because I use my words. I persuade someone because I use their words. So I listen to what they're saying, and I use their words. This is one of my favorite, favorite quotes, uh, quotations. I know it's a very, very long one, but um, I'm going to just shut up and give you a couple of minutes to read this. And so maybe think about it a little bit. And then I, I, there's a couple of things I'd like to say. One thing, I lied. OK, notice, <laughs> notice the date on the bottom, 1957, 57. This guy was saying this in 57. I wonder what would happen if we'd taken this to heart in 57. I don't know. I don't know what the world would be like. But I just think it's amazing because this alarm has been raised for quite a long time. And it's going to continue to be raised. But I think we do need to be aware of the fact that critical thinking is so important. It, education or whatever, uh, with significant others, is very, very important in our lives. It, it should be important. I love, and I love this one, too. I love all these things. Think about it. A lot of people don't want to be confused by the facts. Don't give me the facts. I've already got my mind made up. OK, now you, you might not want to hear some of this stuff. I'm going to say it anyway, because I, I just jump in. That's, that's my nature to do that. So what I'm going to ask us to think about is to not lower our expectations. I know sometimes. Some classes, you know, there's different semesters, different classes, and within the same semester, sometimes one class is like they're sharp and they got it, and the other class is like, you want to have a conversation. Okay, so it's very, very different depending on, on the individual class and the student. But I think it's, it's important that we not lower our expectations. If you have 
a class full of students that are not getting it in any way, shape, or form, I think we still need to have the, the high expectations. We, uh, I was given a, this good advice many years ago, teach to the top 10% of your students. So don't dumb things down. I can think that's, that's insulting to our students. Don't dumb things down. Some people are going to get it, some people aren't, but that's, that's that way in life too, you know? And this one is, I think, probably not going to go over so good, but as educators, as teachers, we don't think, we don't know as much as we think we do. So when they do research on critical thinking and educators, if we're able to teach it well, we don't teach it very well. We just don't. But I think that means then the challenge is for us then to, be, to get better at that. First thing is you need to be aware of the fact that this is not my strong suit or, or whatever, whatever. Like for me, like, I don't want to pick an additional. Like math would not be my strong, I couldn't, no, I could not. <laughs> I can, yeah, so, Beth, no, thank you. <laughs> so there's, I, I have so many areas that I'm not good at, so, I, and I don't try to excel at that, but I want to take one or two areas that, that I feel like I'm okay at, competent at, and I want to like make that the best teaching experience I can. I think it's so important. Our students need to know there's so much disinformation going on all over the place, constantly. How do they know what to believe? And we teach them that you do this and this and this, but, but we need to actually teach them to think for themselves. I think that's the greatest gift we can give our students, is to think for themselves. Um, also, some other thoughts. Be humble, and I think a lot of, most of us are humble. Students don't do optional. We already knew that, but you know, we still want them to do optional, and they don't do optional, so just don't give it up. Don't expect that and expect more from students and ourselves. And when, what I say to students, um, in my students on a regular basis, challenge yourself. Do more than you think you can do. Take the time and effort to do your best. Don't just throw things together. And forgive yourself and others. I think that's important that we do that. Um, I think some of us have a harder time forgiving ourselves than we do other people. But I think it's, it's good to have some balance in your life. Okay, here's some ideas I've come up with over the years. Like I said, I've been doing this for, for one or two years. So, so these are some ways that I integrate critical thinking into my existing course content. So I'm not suggesting that everybody just teach critical thinking, but what I'm asking you to think about, maybe, is if there's, if there's anything, any of these idea, ideas that you can bring into your coursework, maybe try to do that. And like I said, I, each, each of my courses requires two different books. The, chat, the critical thinking book, but there's other critical thinking books. This is just one that I've used for years and years. It's a workbook for students. Um, it's very, very user friendly for the students. So I think that's good to have that because like I said earlier, you have to have a separate component to teach critical thinking and then you lay, overlay your course content, whatever corrections or ethics or whatever you're, you're laying on top of that and you integrate them. This third bullet might be kind of funny. Expect that students read both texts, you know. I know my students always read both texts. Well, I would like it if they read one text. Okay, I would be happy with that. But, but, so I, but I, haven't, I don't lower my expectations. I expect you to read, and I'm not going to tell you what's on page 79. You're capable of reading it. You read it. And then read it before class, and then you come to class, and we'll talk about it. I'm not going to sit there and read a PowerPoint and tell you what's on the PowerPoint, because it's in your book. Um... And I think what we need to do is prepare students and kind of like ease into the integration of critical thinking in content-specific text. So when I'm teaching about, or when, when I first, you know, at the beginning of the semester when we talk about what to expect from our course, I tell them we're going to use critical thinking to examine our course content, meaning the criminal justice content. So I'm not, short, short, I'm not giving short shrift to, to criminal justice because that's what we're there to do. But I think it's important that we talk, examine criminal justice through the lens of critical thinking. Um, I incorporate critical thinking into assignments and discussions. I teach face-to-face -face and online. So for both kinds of classes, when, when somebody does a discussion question, I expect them to apply critical thinking and I expect them to tell me what critical thinking concepts they've used. 
So that tells me, if they're right there, have they, have they read the book? Do they know what's going on with, when, when we're talking about critical thinking? For example, when we have, I have research papers, my husband told me for years, don't do that to yourself, and I, and I did it anyway, and then, but then I, this, this year I, I quit doing it so much, but, but um, I think writing, that's how you learn how to write, you know, you guys know, that's how you learn how to write, it's by writing. So I think in, in the research paper, which I think is important to do, there's a component of critical thinking. They're graded partially on, did you incorporate critical thinking? And if I can't tell that you incorporated it, then te that tells me that you didn't do it and you don't know what we're talking about. I also let my students um, selected assignments. They, they can, if, for example, in the research paper, I grade it. The grade's not great. I give them the chance to go back and do it again, which I think is a part of, cri part of critical thinking. Okay, this is what, and I give them feedback, this is what, what I saw, this is how, on the different areas of the rubric, this is where I saw your, your, your points, and if you want to go back and think about it, or we'll talk about it, and then you try and do it again, I think that's important, not just you got one shot and that's it, I think it's important. If they choose to take the time and effort, then I'm going to take the time and effort to read it a second time. Group test, I know this, I, I think, Group test, when I first heard that term, it's like, that's insane. Why would you possibly do that? So it depends on the class, of course. You're not going to do it with all the classes. And it depends on the size of the class. But, so I've tried group tests, and there's some research to support that it's, it's not a bad thing, necessarily. Um, the, group, the, the, the students can break into small groups, meaning three or four students. There's two parts to, to every one of my exams. The first part of the exam, you can sit with your three or four students. You take the exam, and then you, can, you discuss it. If, if the rest of the people in your group thinks the correct answer is A and you think it's B, then you write down B. I give students the, the option when we do that. Um, you don't have to take, you don't have to do a small group test if you don't want to. And then the second part of the test, they do independently, it, separate, separate. So it's, they check in a group test, but that's just por a portion of the test. And I, what I see over and over again is the students learning from each other when they have a chance to talk about it. And so it's not such, maybe such high stakes. The grades don't, don't get any better necessarily, but, but they've had a chance to talk to somebody else about what, what do you think is the right, right answer. Um, I also do, because it's criminal justice, an exam autopsy, which I thought was a cool name. I love it. <laughs> exam autopsies, if nobody's done one, there's some forms that you can do. And what, what you ask the student to do is consider how they prepared, what things have they done to prepare for the exam. And the second part to that is, during the exam, what did I do during the exam? And then I have them use critical thinking to talk about this, okay? Did you like your grade? If you didn't, then, then what are some things, if anything, that you want to try and do next time? So they, they're thinking through this. this is, these are things that I didn't do this time, maybe next time I will. I don't know if anybody else has any other ideas to incorporate critical thinking. This is when you talk and I listen. <laughs> I don't even think about it. It, it. Critical thinking is applicable in math, in science, in it, it's applicable in all the disciplines. You're going to in, incorporate it different ways, of course, but it's not just for a, one or two disciplines. Critical thinking can be integrated into any of the course content that you have. Okay, so I also want to let you know that um, if you haven't, if you're going to consider this and you haven't methodically integrated critical thinking into your course content, there's going to be a learning curve. I remember when I first started, and it was like, why am I doing this? I, I just was committed to the fact that I think that, that was a good idea, but there was, there was a pretty steep learning curve for me anyway. I have, tend to have steep learning curves, like computers and that kind of stuff. So I had have a lot of peaks and valleys, but I think it's important that, that we try to see, is, is there some, some piece of that? There's a lot of resources out there that you could check and see, is there something I can do? Um, when people, critical thinking is, is a set of knowledge, but there's also a disposition. There's a kind of a person that likes to do critical thinking. And then there's people that don't, okay? But if you're one of those people that, that has that disposition for critical thinking, that might be something that you, that you want to investigate a little bit more. And here are my two references, okay? 
in so I'm done thank you very much I appreciate those I lied again. No, I'm not done. These are the two books, so I'm going to have them down in the reception. If you want to look through these just to see what it's like, um, you'd be my guest. And we do have a copy of that book in the Office of Faculty Development, so feel free to borrow it. Thank you both so much. I think you both said different, such different things, but such meaningful and important things. And I really, we are all grateful, I know, to have had you share your experience and wisdom and reflections with us. Um, do anybody want to ask any questions or anything, or should we? Okay, I say let's give a huge round of applause to these. <laughs>